high-risk CLL has traditionally included those patients who carry chromosomal deletions of the short arm of 17 and the long arm of 11, as well as patients with early relapse after highly effective therapy, like chemoimmunotherapy. And about half of patients have unmutated IGHV, which is another traditional high-risk group. With these new drugs, we find that really the latter groups, the ones with short remissions to standard therapy or with 11Q deletion, for example, have a much better prognosis than they used to. They can have quite durable remissions with these new drugs. And so the definition of high-risk CLL has evolved to include primarily the 17P deleted group, who we're realizing further may be better stratified also based on the complexity of their karyotype. And then the other group, which is now high risk, is those who relapse after BCR pathway inhibitors. That group remains one that's relatively hard for us to treat. Right now, the best data that we have for the treatment of these patients is based on venetoclax, which is a BCL2-specific inhibitor that was approved by the FDA in April for relapsed patients with 17P deletion. And that drug has been reported to have a 60% overall response rate in patients previously treated with ibrutinib. But the follow-up is still quite short, and the durability is not known. We also don't know if we'll get the same depth of response that we've seen with venetoclax in patients not previously treated with ibrutinib. So that's really my first go-to drug. Other alternatives that could be considered include the PI3 kinase inhibitors, although there are quite limited data with them specifically in this patient population. And I even sometimes go back to the old high-dose methylprednisolone, which can control the disease that worsens markedly when you stop the ibrutinib. I'm very excited about combining ibrutinib and venetoclax. Abrutinib is particularly effective on nodal disease and pulling cells out of the nodes into the blood and bone marrow, while venetoclax is very effective at clearing blood and bone marrow. They also have in vitro synergy in many lymphoma cell lines and CLL cells. And so the hope would be that they work by different mechanisms, the mechanisms of resistance against them are different, and that if we combine them, we can reduce the outgrowth of resistance. Abrutinib by itself very rarely results in MRD negativity, and so it often results in deep remissions, but they're usually still partial, and even if they become complete, they're usually not MRD negative. Now, venetoclax does have a reasonable rate of achieving complete remissions and MRD negativity, which is probably higher in less heavily pretreated patients than in more heavily pretreated ones. But still, as a single agent, it's not a huge effect. About 20% in the relapse refractory patients will have a complete remission. And so the combination of abrutinib plus venetoclax together, for example, I think could be very promising in this regard. And we have actually seen some very good MRD negativity data with venetoclax plus rituximab, just the anti-CD20 antibody rituximab, in less heavily pretreated patients with two prior regimens. The MRD negative rate was about 50%. And so combinations are clearly where we need to head to achieve this level of depth of remission in high-risk patients. Mm -hmm.